So I'm doing the lecture on fat as a metabolic fuel, um, and this is part of the OSME National Preclinical Revision course. My name is Rohit, and I will be doing this lecture today. So um, the way I've broken it down is that we're going to first talk about structure related to function of uh, function in fats, and I've written out the spec specification references so it'll allow you to check your spec and um, yeah, and highlight it off. So um, why are fats used for the generation of energy? Well, the main reason why they're used is that they have a very high en uh, energy density compared to glucose. And that is predominantly down to the fact that each fat or triglyceride contains three chains, three fatty acid chains, and each of those chains can give rise to acetyl-CoA, which can then go into the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. So essentially you'd be having three fatty acids that can be converted into acetyl-CoA and sent into Krebs cycle. So fats are very good at storing energy because they can, they have a lot of energy within them and as that contains a hydrophilic head, which is the um, fatty acids and a high, uh, sorry, which is the glycerol and a hydrophobic head, which is the fatty acids. And so they would form globules normally. And so uh, they're very, very uh, compact as storing of energy. They are also very easily me metabolizable and we'll talk about why. And also they're very easily mobilized. So from your uh, tissues that store fat, like adipose tissue, they are very easily mobilizable and then can be used to generate energy. But an issue is that fatty acid uh, metabolism is called fatty acid oxidation. And so it needs a lot of energy, a lot of oxygen. And therefore, it is very oxygen dependent as a process. And so not all tissues tend to utilize fats as a generation of energy source. But we will talk about those that do. Now, just as a basic point, fatty uh, triglycerides are composed of fatty acids. So you can have either saturated fatty acids or unsaturated fatty acids, or you can have, uh, and, and that is normally attached to a glycerol molecule. And that is through an ester linkage. And so if you, you can hydrolyze the ester, ester linkage by hydrolysis. Now, that, allow, that is essentially how the structure is related to the function. So ester, ester bonds allow you to release the fatty acids on the triglyceride. It's high energy and um, it can be very easily metabolized. Now, we're going to talk about how, how it's digested and assimilated um, as fat, and that is in your specification as well. So um, once you eat anything that contains triglycerides in it, they would normally be uh, ingested and then form fat globules. And the reason for the fat globules is that, as we discussed, each fat, each triglyceride contains a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. And so they would essentially form this sphere where all of their hydrophobic tails are inwards and their hydrophilic heads are outwards towards the, the water. And some of these triglycerides are digested um, by lipases within your stomach, but also within your mouth. So lingual lipase and gastric lipase. But the reason why most of them aren't is that these fat globules tend to be very large. And so they have a very low surface area relatively to fat droplets, which is what forms later on within this process. And so by having a very a, a relatively lower surface area, there is a, a lower rate of enzyme enzymatic activity. So majority of the, the triglycerides actually are digested after they bind with bile salts. Now bile in this, in the picture you can see on the left, Bile is, is made by the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and that bile is released through this cystic duct and uh, common bile duct into the duodenum, which is the, the initial part of the small intestines. And once these bile, bile salts are released into the duodenum, they then bind to these uh, fat globules and essentially emulsify them. Emulsification is, is another way, way word of saying that these fat globules are converted into smaller fat droplets. And as you can see in the image, essentially these bio cells bind and separate these little droplets out from each other. And in doing so, you're essentially massively increasing their surface area because now you've got, you've converted this large fat globule into two, into much, much smaller fat droplets. Now, 
because there's an increase in surface area, there's an increase in enzymatic activity. And by the time it reaches the ileum, which is the final part of this small intestines, majority of the, the uh, lipids are digested. And most of this will come from the pancreatic lipase, which is released by the pancreas through that common uh, cystic, through that cystic duct into the duodenum. So when this fat moves through the stomach and into the small intestines, not only is it being emulsified, but is it, it's also being um, con 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 concomitantly um, hydrolyzed and digested by these pancreatic lipases. And, and the way the pancreatic lipases work is that they cleave that um, ester linkage that we were talking about earlier. And in doing so, they you separate the triglyceride into glycerol or monoglycerides, meaning a glycerol molecule with one fatty acid as opposed to three, or you completely go into glycerol and three fatty acids. And in doing so, you've now separated this, this triglyceride into, in, in, into its two constituent forms, which are the glycerol and fatty acids, which can then be absorbed. Now, the absorption is impo important to know. And the reason for that is, is that um, it's the way it's once it's absorbed, then it needs to enter the systemic circulation. And so and normally these fatty acids, these triglycerides aren't able to enter passively. And so they need to be broken down into smaller molecules like monoglycerides or glycerol. And they would form these mixed micelles. So this mixed micelles that you can see at the top is essentially um, consistent of cholesterol, consisting of um, monoglycerides or um, uh, glycerol and fatty acids. And these are passively absorbed by the ileum in the small intestines at the villi. And in the microvilli, you, um, in microscopically, there are, these, um, there are these vessels underneath, which are essentially lymphatic vessels called lacteals, and they will then absorb it. But before that, what has to happen is that once they're absorbed, they are reconstituted back into triglycerides, but then they are attached to cholesterol and lipoproteins to make chylomicrons. Now, these, this would normally happen within the endoplasm reticulum of the cell, of the enterocytes. And once they're um, reconstituted back and formed into chylomicrons by attachment with cholesterol and lipoproteins, they're then taken up by these lacteals, which is lymphatic circulation. And then as a result, they can then go on to enter the, the systemic circulation at the subclavian vein. Because all these lymphatic vessels will, will drain at some point into these subclavian veins, and then therefore it enters systemic circulation as chylomicrons. Now, once they form chylomic, once they enter the systemic circulation as chylomicrons, they have two possible destinations. One is they can be, uh, they're destined to go into, as, as go into storage to be stored as fats, or that they can be used up for energy. Now, um, as you know, they would be stored in, as you may know even, they might be stored in adipose tissue and the way they're stored is that the fatty acids from the chylomicrons are taken up, reconstituted back into fat, and they form globules within these cells called adipocytes. And whenever they're needed, they can then be mobilized very easily, for example, during starving. Alternatively, um, they can be used for energy. Now, there's three, um, three parts of the human body that is very dependent on the usage of fatty acids for energy. And they are your type one sl slow twitch skeletal muscle. And they're slow twitch because they have a very high amount of mitochondria and they're very reliant on oxidation as opposed to glycolysis, which is type three or type one C. Um, and these skeletal muscles um, are very reliant on fatty acid oxidation to maintain their resting energy homeostasis. And they are at their maximal rates during moderate intensity. They will also end up using a bit of. Uh, they will also end up using glucose and, in in longer periods of training, a bit of glycogen as well. But for resting energy homeostasis, they are very dependent on fatty acids and uh, fatty acid oxidation. Heart is another one of these organs that is very dependent on fatty acid oxidation to generate energy. In fact, almost 50 to 70 percent of its ATP is derived from oxidation, and this can change based on in heart failure in diabetes, et cetera. And finally, um, the renal cortex is very dependent. Although the kidney is in general dependent on um, fatty acid oxidation, the renal cortex even more so with almost 50% of its ATP coming from fatty acid oxidation. So these chylomicrons have essentially 
two destinations and depending on the energy state at that time they can either go for storage or energy now the we're going to first talk about how they how they are regulated at their fat storage um, destination so at adipocytes in adipose tissue now when chylomicrons arrive at adipose tissue their first that the way they're taken up is that they are first cleaved by this enzyme called lipoprotein lipase, which hydrolyzes this chylomicrons into fatty acids. And once these fatty acids are released, they can then be taken up by these um, adipocytes and then stored as fat globules within themselves. And again, that's because, uh, and, and again, they would be stored within it as, as fat globules because they're able to, um, they're reconstituted back into triglycerides. And so they can, ha they have a polar head and a um, non-polar tail, which will then sort of form into a spherical shape because of thermodynamics. Now, once they're there, they can stay there for a long time as, as fat globules. But when there is when when a person individual is starving or they need extra energy, um, the body can then help to mobilize these. And this is mobilized by, uh, due to one enzyme involved called hormone, hormone sen sensitive lipase or HSL for short. And this is a very big hub for regulation because it can be regulated by loads of different hormones and um, energy, global energy states within the body. And once they, the way they work is that they will cleave these triglycerides again into fatty acids, so essentially again, breaking that uh, ester linkage between the glycerol and fatty acids. And in doing so, it releases these newly esterified fatty acids into the blood. And then these can then go on and um, go into peripheral tissue, which require the energy and then be used up there by uh, beta oxidation, which we'll talk about soon. Now, this hormone sensitive lipase can be um, regulated by a variety of hormones, one of which is insulin. Now at high insulin, it is essentially um, activated, it's essentially uh, deactivated by phosphorylation, uh, by um, dephosphorylation or protein phosphatase which would um, essentially deactivate the HSL by binding to the TK receptors on these, or tyrosine kinase receptors on these cells. And in doing so, the downstream effect is the activation of protein phosphatase, which deactivates HSL. And so during starvation states, when there is low insulin, there is an increased activation of HSL because there is a decreased um, repression on it because of um, dephosphatases or phosphatases in general. Adrenaline is another hormone that can affect uh, HSL activation. And the way it does that is that it phosphorylates um, HSL by binding to beta-2 adrenergic receptors and causing uh, the activation of PKA because it rises CAMP. And in doing so, PKA can then activate HSL. And then by increasing HSL activation, it means more fatty acids are liberated. And so during starvation, you would find a very high concentration of fatty acids at around two millimoles per litre. And we'll talk about what the, the effects of these are um, in diabetes towards the end of this lecture, as, um, for example, in, in type 1 diabetes, when there is low insulin in general, um, or very, when there is low insulin uh, production, it can lead to diabetic ketoacidosis, which we'll talk about as a big consequence, which is very clinically important. Now, we're going to now shift our focus from looking at how it's stored to now how it can be oxidized for energy in those energy um, requiring tissues. And the way we will continue this is that we imagine that we've liberated the fatty acids from, from the adipocytes and now these fatty acids liberate, are liberated from the HSL and into the, the systemic circulation. And they will f eventually find their way, their way into tissues like uh, muscles, skeletal muscle. And the first thing first is that these fatty acids from the blood need to enter the cells. And there's two ways it can do that. One is through diffusion. And that would just be because they're inherently lipophilic. Um, and so they can easily cross, cross the uh, phospholipid bilayer or through CD36, which is a fat transporter. And that would then allow it to enter these cells. And once they're in the cytoplasm, they actually need to first get activated, which essentially means they're committing to fatty acid metabolism. So after this stage, they're committed to being metabolized. And this is mediated by the phosphorylation of 
of or the usage of ATP in order to convert a fatty acid into fatty acyl CoA. So this will require a CoA factor. So like acetyl CoA, for example, the CoA that is involved in that. And that is mediated by an enzyme called acyl CoA synthetase. And so that allows these fatty acyls to be converted into fatty acyl CoAs. And in doing so, they become committed to fatty acid metabolism and they can't escape the cell. Now, fatty acid metabolism is occurs in the mitochondria. And so now it needs to go from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria. And that is done through the carnitine shuttle, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but this is just a, an overview just to give you a, a bit of a brief understanding on it before we talk about the specifics. So it enters the mitochondria through this carnitine shuttle, which is nothing but a bunch of transporters. And once it's in the mitochondrial matrix, it, is then, um, un it then undergoes oxidation. And the purpose of fatty acid oxidation is to convert all the fatty acid into acetyl-CoAs and also some reduced cofactors like NADH um, and FADH2. And then these acetyl-CoAs can be shunted into Krebs cycle and then oxidative phosphorylation can happen. So once they're committed, now they need to go into the mitochondria and that's through the carnitine shuttle like we described. Now the carnitine shuttle looks a bit like this. It is composed of three transporters essentially. So, and, and the reason for, for why you need a carnitine shuttle to, to move these fatty ACE or CoAs is that the inner membrane of the mitochondria is actually impermeable to a fatty ACE or CoA. And so the first two, the first step essentially, once it enters the intermembranous space of the mitochondria, is that it needs to combine with some sort of molecule that will allow it to be transported into the matrix of the mitochondria through the inner membrane. Now that molecule is carnitine, which is found within the body and produced by us, by our body. And in this process, what happens is that the fatty acyl CoA is combined with carnitine. And in doing so, it loses its CoA factor and instead carnitine um, binds with these fatty acyl molecules. And this is mediated by the CPT1 or carnitine palmitoyl transferase one. And this is actually very much a regulatory hub for carnitine shuttle and for fatty acid metabolism in general, because it can be inhibited by malonyl-CoA. And um, in, a in a few slides, that makes sense why, but the, essentially the idea is that malonyl-CoA is involved in fatty acid synthesis, which is the opposite to oxidation, right? So by inhibiting fatty acid synthesis, uh, by inhibiting um, fatty acid oxidation, it means that the fatty acid synthesis could occur more efficiently. And so, um, in this case, CPT1 can be allosterically inhibited by malonyl-CoA so that there is a disconnection between, so that you're not having fatty acid oxidation and synthesis at the same time because that would be inefficient. So once it's converted into fatty acyl-CoA, into fatty acyl-carnitine, it can then enter the matrix through carnitine acyl translocase. And that is essentially a, a non-specific channel uh, transporter that essentially can transport anything that is a carnitine derivative. So in this case, fatty, fatty acyl carnitine. Now, once it's in the matrix, it then recombines and reforms um, fatty acyl CoA, and then the carnitine is released back into the matrix, and then that can find its way back through into the intermembranous space where it can redo this process. There is a clinical uh, relevance to the carnitine, and that is systemic carnitine deficiency, which is essentially where there is a deficiency in carnitine, and um, that presents very interestingly through um, cardiomyopathies, which mean dilate, uh, the heart essentially dilates, uh, so dilated cardiomyopathy, and that is all to do with um, the inability to, to um, metabolize fatty acids because it can't enter the uh, mitochondria as well. And remember, we said that um, the heart is very dependent on fatty acid metabolism to make its energy almost 50 to 70% of his ATP is derived from fatty acid oxidation. So the, in, the, the inability for this to happen is a major metabolic burden on the heart, and that can lead to cardiomyopathies. Now, jumping from that back to the carnitine shuttle, now we have our fatty acyl CoA in our matrix, mitochondrial matrix, and now we can do beta oxidation. But beta oxidation is nothing but a bunch of steps that always follows the same routine, which is it first gets the fatty acid CoA, first gets oxidized, then hydrated, then 
higher oxidized and then thiolized or in another way it's just hydrolysis of the um, the um, thiol group which is the the sh group the self self hydro group um, now in for to understand this let's consider our fatty acid to be palmitate and palmitate is a 16 carbon um, fatty acid uh, and the way that it's degraded is these, these cycles of beta oxidation in which essentially every time, every cycle is being stripped to carbon shorter. So essentially palmitate will have six, uh, will have eight cycles of this um, beta oxidation in which it will first go from 16 to 14 to 12 to 10 and then so on until there is no other carbons that are um, part of the fatty acid and everything has been converted. You want to produce firstly as much acetyl-CoA as possible or any derivative that can be sent into the Krebs cycle. So in this case you're going to make eight acetyl-CoA's by the end of it because the at every step you're releasing two you're releasing an acetyl-CoA because an acetyl-CoA is two carbons long and that fatty acetyl-CoA is essentially causing those two carbons to be into acetyl-CoA and then shunted into Krebs cycle. But the other purpose of this is also to generate reduced cofactors. So that includes um, FADH2, NADH plus H plus. And then so then these can then um, donate electrons to the electron transport chain to make even more energy through um, oxidative phosphorylation. So this is why um, fatty acid oxidation is so um, energetically um, interesting because it's releasing energy in two ways. One is by releasing acetyl-CoA, which can then go into the Krebs cycle, make more um, uh, cofactors, and then that can release energy through the Krebs cycle, through the oxidative phosphorylation, but also through the substrate, at the substrate level, generating uh, electrons uh, through electron carriers like FADH2. Now, um, so the purpose of this is number one, to make a load of acetyl-CoA, number two, to make a load of FADH2 and NADH. And the third one is that you want to con convert the entire fatty acid structure, carbon structure into um, acetyl-CoA molecules or something that can be shunted into Krebs cycle. In the case that the fatty acid is an odd carbon shape, for example, 17 carbons long instead of 16, then at the five carbon stage, so when it's already been, um, when it's already have gone multiple beta oxidation cycles, that at the five carbon stage it is then broken into propanol CoA and acetyl CoA. Now propanol CoA can then be converted into succinyl CoA, which enters the, the Krebs cycle, and then this acetyl CoA remains. So the beta oxidation enables the entire carbon. Um, chain to be converted into acetyl coa or something that can be used in Krebs cycle. So in the case of palmitate, you're going to end up leaving seven FADH2s, seven NADH pluses, and eight acetyl coas And this is even before you've gone on to oxidative phosphorylation. So it's very, very um, energetically interesting. Now, that is essentially the beta oxidation stuff done. So we've talked about fatty acid oxidation. Now, the other, the flip side of it is fatty acid synthesis. And also we're going to talk about ketone bodies and we'll get to what that is in a second. But essentially fatty acid synthesis happens in the liver. And this might look like a very complex diagram, but it's very easy. And it's just a bunch of steps that is very intuitive. So let's start back where we had fatty acid oxidation, which was at in the mitochondrial matrix where we formed loads of acetyl coas and then they would have, in the case of fatty acid oxidation, joined and been uh, joined the electron transport chain and the Krebs cycle, and they would have generated energy uh, through ATP. Um, but in this case, now we're going to go to the opposite way, where we're going to go from acetyl coa all the way back to a fatty acid. Now, this happens, so when the reason why we get loads of acetyl coas um, being converted into these fatty acids is during times of very high energy. So for example, when there's a lot of amino acid metabolism and high glucose levels, the levels of acetyl-CoA is gonna be very high. And at high acetyl-CoA concentrations, it allows the increased production of citrate, which can then escape into the cytoplasm and then undergo fatty acid synthesis. Now, the way that acetyl-CoA first is 
enters enters the cytoplasm from the mitochondria is that it's converting to citrate and the way it's converting to citrate is that um, it essentially binds with oxaloacetate which is a um, a metabolite within the Krebs cycle and upon binding to it eventually it will make citrate and that can be then transported through the trigolf carboxylate transporter which is a non-specific transporter into the cytoplasm now once in the cytoplasm it gets converted back into acetyl coa and that's through this uh, step where it, there is atp citrate lyase and this actually uses up an atp molecule in order to drive this conversion back into um, acetyl coa and once it's made into acetyl coa in the cytoplasm it then undergoes a commitment step so just like in fatty acid oxidation where there was a commitment um, step in which um, you would form the acetyl coa uh, in which you would form um, fatty acyl coa in here you're forming acetyl coa which is then con committed by essentially being uh, carboxylated into malonyl coa now malonyl coa is a three carbon molecule and um, it itself is not used in fatty acid synthesis a big difference between fatty acid synthesis and fatty acid oxidation is that unlike fatty acid oxidation which uses coa as a factor or cofactor a in fatty acid synthesis it's very dependent on acp which is acyl carrier protein or acp in this case and so that's a difference in between them and once you so that in order to make that you'd have to go from malonyl coa to malonyl acp and that's mediated by this mcat um uh enzyme which is malonyl coa trans acylase acyclase even um, and then it undergoes uh, again just similar to fatty acid um, oxidation it undergoes a bunch of steps now a very easy way to remember what the steps are is that just learn you just have to learn the steps for um, one of them so for fatty acid oxidation and, and you just work back so if we go back to beta oxidation the steps are oxidation, hydration, oxidation, dialysis or hydrolysis. Now let's work back from the bottom up and look at what the opposite of each of these are. So the opposite to thiolysis or hydrolysis is condensation. The opposite of oxidation is reduction. The opposite of hydration is dehydration. And again, the opposite of oxidation is reduction. Now imagine the steps go. So therefore the steps in um, fatty acid synthesis is exactly the opposite to this. So you'd start off with hydrolysis, with uh, condensation, then you'd go to reduction, then you'd go to dehydration, and then you'd go back to de uh, reduction. So you're working from the from bottom up, and it's the opposite of what you learned for beta oxidation. So in this case, you've gone condensation, then reduction, then dehydration, and then again reduction. And the purpose of this is essentially to extend a malonyl CoA chain to as long as possible. So in the in the first cycle, you would bind with an acetyl ACP. So an acetyl CoA is actually converting to acetyl ACP. And you would essentially form a butyl ACP by the end of it, which is four carbons. And then in subsequent um, passes, in subsequent reactions, that would then feed back in and bind with more malonyl CoA and essentially be elongated until whatever size. So in this case, 16 carbons long would be palmitate or palmitoyl ACP. Now, all the en enzymes that are involved in fatty acid synthesis. So if I go back and I showed you, you know, uh, keto acyl ACP synthase, keto acyl, uh, keto acyl ACP reductase, all of these, which have sort of had this uh, K S K R D H E R just to simplify it down. They're all present in one single polypeptide, and that's called the fatty acid synthase. And that is one very large dimeric molecule that has multiple catalytic domains in them. And each of these domains are responsible for one of these uh, steps. That's very different to fatty acid oxidation, where all the enzymes are separate to each other. And this is likely because um, fatty acid synthesis happens in the cytoplasm, which can host such a big uh, enzyme. And um, whereas in fatty acid um, uh, oxidation that happens in the mitochondria, um, where it's unlikely to have done so, but also that um, the mitochondria has evolved, uh, yeah, the mitochondria has evolved essentially to be within the cell um, through uh, entering the cell. Anyway, um, 
So essentially, these are the differences. One happens in the mitochondrial matrix, one happens in the cytoplasm. One involves the de degradation of a two carbon um, of a fatty acid into two carbon units like acetyl CoA, which can then be shunted into the Krebs cycle. Um, and the, whereas the uh, fatty acid synthesis involves the elongation, so the opposite of degradation, if you elongate a three carbon unit, which is malonyl CoA slash malonyl ACP, into a longer molecule, into a longer fatty acid. And whereas fatty acid oxidation produces NADH, fatty acid synthesis uses NADPH, and so one uses energy, one makes energy in, in the process. And unlike fatty acid synthesis, where all the enzymes are involved in one single polypeptide in uh, fatty acid oxidation, they're all separate and not part of a single complex. Now we'll talk about ketone bodies. Now, ketone bodies um, are essentially four carbon molecules that are um, used as a alternative source of acetyl-CoA for Krebs cycle. So just like fatty acids can be converted into acetyl-CoA, so can ketone bodies. Now, um, ketone bodies are specifically produced in the liver, and this is during fasting and starvation. And this is just another, um, uh, another sort of um, destination for the acetyl-CoA molecules that can be, that, that are produced, that are within the liver. And we'll talk about that in a second, but there's three examples of ketones that you need to know. Acetoacetate, acetone, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Now the, the predominant one that is produced is beta-hydroxybutyrate. And I'll show you, I'll show you in a second about how it changes. And one key thing to remember is that it happens in the liver. It doesn't happen anywhere else. Once it's made in the liver, then it gets transported out to the peripheral tissues where it can be used. And this happens predominantly during starvation and, and fasting because ketone body metabolism occurs in conjunction with gluconeogenesis. So the process by which you make glucose through alternative sources. And this is mainly because there's a, there's an increase, there's a, almost like there's a diversion from the Krebs cycle. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a second. So there's two steps, there's two uh, types of ketone body uh, metabolism stuff. There's ketogenesis, which you make ketones, and there's ketolysis. In ketogenesis, um, in the liver, you essentially combine two acetyl-CoA molecules into acetoacetyl-CoA, and then that binds with a further acetyl-CoA molecule through this HMG-CoA synthase, and essentially you end up forming a six-carbon molecule, um, or a four-carbon molecule eventually, that can then be converted into either acetone or beta-hydroxybutyrate. And the purpose of, of making, uh, the purpose of this, the reason why you, you can do ketogenesis in the liver during starvation is that when gluconeogenesis happens, the oxaloacetate within the, um, within the Krebs cycle is very much depleted because the oxaloacetate is actually used as a substrate for gluconeogenesis. And so that means that the acetyl-CoA can no longer bind with oxaloacetate to make citrate. So therefore, it just gets shunted into this, this, this pathway, which is the ketogenesis pathway, where it combines with other acetyl-CoAs and eventually forms these ketone bodies, which is acetoacetate, acetone, or beta-hydroxybutyrate. Now, the predominant one is beta-hydroxybutyrate, especially as the fasting um, to starvation increases in hours. So in this graph, you can see here, um, essentially by, by 24 hours or by 20 hours that by a significant margin beta-hydroxybutyrate is in its greatest concentration. Nephus is nothing but um, newly esterified fatty acids and acetoacetate is another ketone. So essentially it's showing that um, ac uh, acetoacetate and, and fatty acids are generally lower but uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate is very high during fasting. So essentially ketogenesis is at high levels, at high rates during uh, starvation. The opposite to this is ketolysis. And ketolysis is the process by which you um, convert ketones back into uh, acetyl-CoAs. And this normally happens in peripheral tissue. So what, once made in the liver, it then gets sent to peripheral tissues where it can um, essentially can be converted into acetyl-CoA. Now, the reason why it doesn't happen in the liver is that the, the enzymes are not present within it. And it is, it is important to know that because 
if there were the enzymes present, it would be very futile. It would be very inefficient for the liver just to make ketone bodies and then straight hydrolyze them into peripheral into uh, acetyl CoA. So this gets transported into peripheral tissues, including the brain, which is very dependent on on um, uh, using ketone bodies. And uh, the process by which this happens is that it essentially does the exact opposite to how ketogenesis occurs. So instead of going from um, acetyl CoA to beta hydroxybutyrate, now you're going from beta hydroxybutyrate back to acetyl acetate, acetyl 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 CoA and then acetyl two acetyl CoA molecules. And that will require that will end up also producing some cofactors in between, which is your NADH, and also convert succinyl CoA back into succinate. Um, and this is an this is important to know because um, a clinical relevance of this is diabetic ketoacidosis, and this is this occurs when there's insulin deficiency, um, and when there's a low amount of insulin, that increases the rate at which gluconeogenesis happens, and in doing so, you are essentially shunting a lot more of the acetyl CoA's into this ketogenesis pathway that we mentioned before. And so increased ketogenesis means increased ketolysis because there's more ketones to use, or even if not, these ketones will then stay in the blood. And as ketones are, can be uh, produced back into carboxylic acids, or they can dissociate into forming, into releasing protons, it can lower the pH of the blood. And in lowering the pH of the blood, there is an acidosis within the blood or an acidemia within the blood, which means that the, the blood is at a lower physiological pH than normal. And therefore, this can give rise to confusion in the patient. It can give rise to hyperventilation as a, as a compensatory mechanism. And yeah, and, and it's normally treated using insulin. Now, um, one key uh, thing to know about ketones is that they're said to be glucose sparing, which essentially just means that um, they reduce the metabolism of glucose or they, they're essentially acting as another uh, method by which acetyl CoA can be produced without using glucose. The reason why you don't want to use glucose as a main source of energy always is that the brain is very reliant on glucose for acetyl CoA. It cannot metabolize fats. And so, by allowing, and so during starvation, by allowing ketogenesis to happen, the ketone bodies can be used instead of glucose as acetyl CoA. Um, to produce acetyl CoA, which can then make energy through Krebs cycle, then that spares glucose to then go to the uh, to tissues that are very reliant on glucose, like the brain, to to still continue utilizing energy. So that's why it's glucose sparing is that effect that it's sparing glucose for tissues that need it by acting as another source of acetyl CoA molecules. And that is pretty much it. That covers all the the topic of um, fat as a metabolic fuel. And if you have any questions, feel free to email um, preclinicalrevisioncourse at gmail.com or my email, which is rohitdovichawa at hartford.ox.ac.uk. If you would like the, a copy of the handout um, of, of this lecture, then if you can fill out the feedback form which will be posted, um, then you can get the copy of the handout.